Little streams tumble down from the heights and gather in Glen Thone before emptying into Loch Barra over small beaches of pink granite sand. Out from the narrow wedge end of the lake, the Gibara spills over and rambles down through a great stretch of blanket bog, cutting its path between turf banks and exposing the granite blocks broken off from the heights and scattered down the slope long before the peat formed. It runs, twisting and bending through shallows, sliding into dark pools and spilling over sharp granite sills on its way to Duhri. At Duffy's, it surges through a narrow gorge and tumbles down granite steps, and again at Bafluk, it leaps through a split in the rock before coming to a leisurely flow through the long Kaya Pool. Here it is joined by the Glen Lehin stream, carrying the water of many small lakes down through Clahornamore. Through rocky outcrops and old fields, now overgrown with bracken, the Gebara makes its way to the low ground. It bends sharply at the foot of the rising hills above Duhri, where the own wee flows in from Kameen. Down through the sheltered valley among trees and under the red bridge, the water from Lochachari and the foothills of Derry Vey spill into the Gibara before it runs under Duhri Bridge to meet the tide. The journey to the sea takes the river from pool to dark flat pool down the estuary. First slipping between high turf banks, then onto muddy flats, the estuary broadens out into a strip of grey sand, with the river snaking in curves, sometimes dividing into thin channels and coming together again. Close to the shore, it may ripple through weed-covered rocks, then suddenly change direction and wander across to the other side. Its course through the long estuary changes constantly, and in the course of a year, what was once a long, deep pool becomes a high bank of soft sand. The estuary narrows at Gibara Bridge, and the tide surges through the stout, round struts with impressive force. It widens again by Gunner's Pier and opens out into a wide space of sand and a scatter of small islands where seabirds perch and seals bask and dry out in the air before the return of the tide. At last, the final run to the open sea through the turbulent bar mouth. The Gibara is a relatively small, short river, but it has its moments of grandeur. It is the natural feature that defines this part of Donegal and shapes its character and culture. The old crossing point makes Duhri the human hub of the Gibara. The crossing at Balnacarrick was a difficult and often dangerous step on the path between Glenties and Dunlow. Later, the old bridge was thrown across the narrow point at Letcher, and the present structure now carries the modern traffic of commerce and tourism across the estuary. 
The river has a long history of human habitation, from the Neolithic people who gathered on the beach at Dewey to cook and eat their meal of shellfish, to the modern community of today. We are fortunate that the Gibara is still largely unspoiled and unpolluted, but vigilance will be needed to keep it like that for the generations to come. Glenbarra is on the Caledonian fault line. The Great Glen of Scotland is visible, from Inverness in the east, through Loch Ness and on to Ireland, cutting County Donegal neatly in half. We have the Blue Stack Mountains to the south, and vast rolling boglands rising to empty hills that sweep northwards and deeper into the Gaeltach, the Irish-speaking area of Donegal. There was a social division between landlords or gentry and the ordinary people. It was here in Glenbarra that events were to unfold that set in motion a clash between the local people and the claims of the landlords. Here, in Duhury, choices had to be made. Allow me to take you back to 1906, the 31st of January to be more precise. It was on this day that the Marquis of Cunningham and the Earl of Mayo commenced an action in the High Court to establish their exclusive title and use thereof to the Gibara fishery. This action was to initiate a chain of events that was to conclude with a victory for the local people along the Gibara. The legal sparring had already begun during the previous year. Are you, sir, a Mr. William O'Donnell, currently resident of Duhury in the county of Donegal? I am indeed. Then it is my duty to serve you with this injunction on behalf of the Marquis of Cunningham. It is an injunction to restrain yourself and your servants from infringing and entering upon the Gibara fishery, and killing and taking salmon or other fish therein. I suggest you peruse this document at your leisure. As the documents had not been lodged with the court by the appropriate date, William O'Donnell applied to have the action dismissed. However, Mr Justice Barton, the presiding judge, had other ideas. <coughs> The court hereby orders the case of Cunningham and O'Donnell to be adjourned until November of this year, by which time this court expects said affidavit to be placed before the court. Now, you may ask who William O'Donnell was, and why was he the subject of a legal action? O'Donnell was a respected citizen in Glenbarra, and had local support and affection. He owned some land, but more importantly was a fisherman in and around the Gibara. If an example was to be made, then he was the man the landlords needed to humiliate. Now, the rest of this case is one for the lawyers among you. There are lots of heretofores Precedents, fiduciary rights of landlords, grants of land by James I of England and Scotland, sub-clauses and paragraphs amended, herewith and in perpetuity. However, I won't bore you with all that. Still, it's awfully complicated and 
pint of beer and a full pipe will help settle my nerves. So make yourselves comfortable. However, O'Donnell and his supporters, like Master Kelly and Father Scanlon, were made of sterner stuff. They had formed the Gibara Game and Fishing Committee to fight the case. Men such as P. H. O'Donnell, the prominent local businessman, gave both financial and moral support, and the people were prepared to pledge their last cow to help finance the action. The court case began on the 31st of January, 1906, in the High Court before Mr. Justice Barton. Now, when all is said and done, and at the risk of simplifying matters too much, all I want to say is this. O'Donnell claimed that the Marquis did not have exclusive rights, and that O'Donnell, the Gibara fishermen and their ancestors had been regular fishermen on the river without fear or hindrance in the past, and this had established their right to fish. And what was Justice Barton's conclusion? I find in favour of the latest. Well, that was that. Or so the landlords thought. O'Donnell appealed, and the appeal was heard. The appeal was heard on the 27th of June, 1906, before the Lord Chancellor, Sir Samuel Walker, Lord Justice Fitzgibbon, and Lord Justice Holmes. We are anxious to facilitate the business. Suffice to say, I think I'm getting the hang of this legal jargon. And I quote from Sir Samuel Walker. There has not been sufficient evidence to exclude the public from fishing in these waters. The appeal should be allowed with costs. And that was that. Simple and straightforward. The people of Glenborough, with a multitude of well-wishers and supporters from the Irish diaspora, had won the day. There was a bonfire lit on Coor Wall to celebrate the victory over landlordism. I'm Paddy Boner and I'm 93 years of age and I live in the town of Ihurthur, County Donegal. I worked at, on the building trade all my life, mm -hmm. roofing houses and that. But uh, in England and Scotland? Uh, uh, and I started at 17 years of age and my pay would be about five shillings a day. Uh -huh. Five shillings a day. Oh, was that good money in those days? It wasn't so bad at that time. Did you come back see, home too? See that bridge there, you crossed that bridge, the Gibara Bridge, did you? Mm -hmm. Yes. It was Dutch men that had the contract of that. Oh, yes. There's two of them there along with me. All right. There's their photographs. Uh-huh. 
And were you, were you involved in the building the bridge yourself? Oh, I was. I was for a good file on it. I'd done a lot of the shuttering work on it and all that. But uh, they were good, good men at that kind of work, the Dutchmen. How did you? F how do you find the changes now? Do you think? Do you think living here? Oh, there's plenty of money now. Yeah. Plenty of money. But do you think the people are happier? No, I don't agree with that at all. The old people are very happy, and they had very little. And Only these. We go on to that later. These homes they built, you know, Clohans they called them, and they had the fire on the middle of the floor, and the smoke would be going up through the roof. And the man and woman and the family would sit around the fire at night and they were as happy as lords. They had nothing to lose. They paid no tax, no insurance, there was no electricity light, there was no running water, there was nothing. You lived cheap, yeah. but you had to because you weren't earning any money. And did the people help each other? If, if anybody oh, they did. They were very times. cooperative. They would help each other. If you were short to anything. It would help you. They were self-sufficient as far as food was concerned. They grew plenty of potatoes and they grew corn, that's oats. And before the corn mills were set up here, they used to crush the oats, but they would dry it well first in the places. And they would crush the oats with a stone or some weight. And they'd use that for porridge or anything. And so what was the what was the main food you used to eat when you potatoes, were potatoes? Potatoes and porridge was the main food. Uh -huh. But they got a lot from the Gibala in them days. The, the fish supplemented but the I, diet, did it? Both fish and other stuff they called Dulam and it grew on the top of the seaweed. Yeah. And they used to cut it off and they would boil it. And that sloke Sloak was very good. It was very good medicine if anyone was sick. It was very healthy. It was a laxative. And how did how did people get around in those days? Did you oh, walk, just get walking the, everywhere? We say shanks and air walking. Oh, shanks there were no bicycles. Ah. There were no roads. That's what you call a bridle pass. Mm. And no motor car. Mm. I remember the motor cars coming on here. There were very few motor cars up in 1924. It might be one or two. The Ford, Ford Model T was the first car that came along here. They wore very little clothes before my time. Yes. Very little. And they weaved their own tweed. They kept sheep, you see. Yes. And they used to spin it or twist it. And they were very good. They used to make their own tweed. And they made some kind of heavy garments. Yes. But the clothes wouldn't be up to the standard. But they were private, you know, they covered their body anyway, not like the day. <laughs> there were no such thing as a battery lamp in my young days, a flash lamp. And they got a peak, and they put, they put paraffin oil on the peak about 8 o'clock, but they wouldn't leave maybe till 11. And when they were going out then, they would light the peak and someone would carry it like that. And that was the light they had when they were going home. Ah, yes. And if it was a stormy night, the old man would be given out in the house to be very careful with the fire in case they were born in the house. Oh, yes. Ah, yes. But do to light it near the house. Uh, it's like a village. There's house, old houses all in the ah, I, 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 I remember that? that all populated. And what happened to the people? The people died out. Uh -huh. And I'll tell you why. A lot of the young men never got married, for they seemed the situation the men that came before them had to rear a family, so they thought there was no point in taking children into this world, for there was nothing for them. And when you were a young man, when you were a little boy, did you go fishing yourself when you just... Uh, I don't know, but somewhat not legal fishing. <laughs> oh, well, we better not be going down that road, did And that's, that's the fish you would like best, the now, one you... They had the sweetest taste. <laughs> the one you got that nobody's seen. And did you just make your own fishing, your, your fishing rod and a hook, or how uh, did you Well, mostly with nets we fished. I with the nets. I, oh, well, they had the fishing rods too, but they used to cut rods in the wood to make ah, a fishing right. rod. And they used to bait. The bait was very good for fishing. 
the worm, you know. Mm. But you used to be, did you? And where did you get the worms from? Did you ah, get you get them from place? the soil here. Uh -huh. You get them from the a green worm was very good. And what did the green and then worm on catch? over at the end of Gibara, there were sand needles in the sand, we small ones. Uh -huh. They were great for a bit. Right, so, so the sand eels, uh, what, what, what was the sand eels good for catching? What fish Ah, you put, uh, you put them on to the end of the hook just, and if, if there were any fish in it, they were sure to, they were very fishy, you know, Aye. and they would keep very active for a few days. And that, that would take any fish that was in the oh, area? I, oh, they used to fish a lot with the sand eels, they caught them. Yeah. Yeah, and so what's Pachin made from? Pochin. How do you make pochin? Well, barley was one of the ingredients. The, the barley they grow, and the, the trash set and they got the grain off it, and they spread it out in a dark place, and they put a sheet over it then till it would germinate. The wee buds would come on it. And then they would put it into a big barrel and put the water on it, and they put brown sugar on it, and something like yeast and a few things like that, and it was left there for nine more days. And then out on the hill they had a place for that called a still house. The still was a big place, and there was a small quarter inch copper pipe leaving the still. And the fire would be kept going all night, and just because it was the wee drops from the steam was falling in. You might get a gallon run for a night, a gallon of potty. I'm uh, talking to Michael Boyle of the Cross Tavern in Ballinacarrick by the banks of the Gabara and near to Duhri. Michael, what exactly is your connection with this pub? Um, my grandfather bought this pub in October 1905 at a public auction in Glenties and it's been in the family ever since. And I've been involved for the past 40 years myself with it. See, my grandmother had the pub down below. There were two pubs in the townland here. Right. And the, 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 there's where my grandmother came from when she married my grandfather. So they were actually involved with the two pubs in the townland oh. at one stage. Uh -huh. um, Michael, can you tell me why uh, it's called the Cross Tavern rather than some other name? Is there a reason for that? Uh, well, uh, the, the name was because of the, there's a crossroads here. Like you, you have the road going to Dewey, let them make a word. The road going down to where the old original ferry used to cross the river and the road going back out towards Dunlow. So that, that was a sort of crossroads that way. And uh, the people from the Dunlow, Rosses area, before their bridge was built to the Guibara, which was built in 1896, the old iron bridge, uh, there used to be a ferry going across down here. And um, with the rowing boats and people took them across, you know, the, the fair day was a big one here, like, you know. And what exactly was the fair day? Um, well, it was held on the 20th of every month. And people from all around the area and further afield again, even from places as far as Letterkenny and Donegal Town and all cattle dealers and sheep dealers came here. And the local people brought in their stock and they were sold at auction. A lot of the deals would have been started and finished here in the bar. Uh, Michael, 
I noticed on your wall you have a photograph of your, your father bottling Guinness with yeah. from a jug. What exactly was that all about? Well, um, that'll be going back to the late 1930s, that photograph. And um, the Guinness at that time came in a keg uh, barrel and um, they washed and bottled and corked the Guinness themselves. And the one memory that I would have about the corked bottles of Guinness, there was no coolers or no coal shelves or anything in those days. And in the summertime in the hot weather, I remember the corks often popping <laughs> out, of, out of the bottles. It's a, it's a sound I can always remember. So these are old flies of your father, Michael? Yeah, they are. And he's dead for 40 years, so they have been around for a long, long time. Um, my memory of him is that he fished an awful lot himself and fished a lot of the lakes as well. So, um, could, you, so could you say, in other words, that had it not been for the, the, the determination of the men in 1906 to, to fight their cause for the right to fish the Gubara, people like your father wouldn't have had that freedom to buy his flies and make mm -hmm. his flies and, and get down and just simply enjoy the, his fishing. That's true. They wouldn't have had that freedom, you know, that, that was the great thing about it, that they had the freedom to go and, and, and to fish it forever they wanted. And so, so in, a, in a sense, these flies are a symbol of that determination and, and, and determination to win. Yeah, true. That is true. It must yeah. make you feel very proud. Ah, that does make you feel proud, all right. Yeah, and it's, it's nice to have them all the time because those things can, can get lost over the years, you know, and it's... It's nice to have them. And great memories. Great memories, yeah, definitely, yeah. And so I fish and daydream without any worry. The Gribara, a people's river. <laughs> Thank you.